Here's some things to keep in mind when it comes to the games. You are given a set of rules, right? And that's usually in an opening paragraph. And then you have uh, three or four like listed rules, right? So step one, I know it can be uh, silly, but take time to read those rules and try to understand them on some intuitive level, right? Like, okay, let me get the lay of the land and try to understand what's going on here. As you get better and better at the games, you will get to a point where you're reading the first sentence in the game and then already maybe diagramming something because you're like, oh, this is clearly an ordering game. I know what to do. But I would actually not assume that at the beginning. I just read through all the rules and then go back and start at the beginning and start reading again and then start writing down what you think will happen. Because your conceptual framework of how the diagram should be set up is going to improve as you continue through reading through the rules. Even if you don't write anything down, right? Like you just start reading and by the time you're done, you're like, okay, I kind of get how these things are relating to each other, right? Now, some people, uh, Graham, Blake actually, is an LSAT tutor in Canada, and he tells people to read the rules four times. Now, I like Graham, but I've never done this, so I would not suggest it to anyone, but I am throwing it out there to get your mind wrapped around how many times people are reading the rules out there. In some cases, I would say twice. So you read through it once, and then you read through it again, and you set up the rules, right? Now, as you get better, you might start setting up the rules or drawing the rules as you're reading the first time through, which means... Um, you read it again, and all you're doing when you read it again is just to confirm that everything you drew is exactly what was said. Because what is going to happen to some of us, and it may even happen on your official test day, which would suck if that's the first time it ever happens to you, but you're going through a game, and halfway through the game you realize, oh shoot, the rule said G is not on fourth. I said I thought it said G is on fourth. And now like everything just has to be thrown out the window and you're like, this is stupid. I totally could have gotten this, but I just misunderstood the rule, right? Really, I misread it. It's not even you misunderstood it. So reading twice can take a little more time, but boy, it can save you a lot of heartache. Okay, so next thing you're gonna wanna do is as you're going through, uh, after you're done reading, you're gonna wanna diagram. Now, <clears throat> there are there's your structure, right? Um, and then there are the rules that go either in the structure or usually somewhere nearby the structure. So to give you an example, like if you have an ordering game and they're asking you to order five people, my structure is one, two, three, four, five. That's my structure, right? And here's slot one, and here's slot five. Now rules tend to go in. So like if they told me that uh, L is third, right, then I'm putting that rule in my diagram. The other rules are going to go near the diagram somewhere close by. So maybe they tell me that K comes before G. I'm going to draw that right below the diagram, right? This is why it's kind of important to read um, through the rules or the whole setup first because you want to figure out your structure and then you incorporate your rules into the structure. So for example, uh, if you have, if if you have a game in which they tell you that, um, I don't know. Let's say that it's like layers of cake. There's a game that talks about layers of cake, and you decide to do your diagram like this, right? Well, if if they told you that uh, M is immediately above L in that cake. Right? If mango is immediately above lemon, then that is how your rule is going to look. Whereas if you decided to draw it like this, then, and this is the top of your cake, and this is the bottom of your cake, then you would actually draw the rule like this. Right? So you've got to figure out your structure first, and then the structure will dictate how you draw your rules. Okay? And then, to, but to figure out your structure, sometimes a lot of people, they're like, oh, I... I just didn't know how to structure it. I didn't know how to set up the diagram, and so this game was a shit show. But once I saw you draw these lines or this or whatever, everything fell into place. Well, okay, how do you get to here? 
you read the rules a couple of times. Like you just until you're like, okay, I kind of see how they're trying to what they're asking me to do. In any case, um, in general, uh, games tend to be ordering, which is going to be left or right, or grouping, which is actually going to be up or down. So like a grouping game might be, hey, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're trying to figure out three people that will work on those three days. I would consider this, a, well, this is actually a hybrid game because they're probably going to ask you to order this stuff as well. But since you have three groups, um, I tend to do my groups vertically, right? Like I'm putting people into columns as opposed to horizontally. Now, the advantage of that is if you do your ordering left to right and you do your grouping uh, up and down, like columns, when you have a hybrid game that involves grouping and ordering, you don't have to change any of the symbols that you've developed for both of these types of games. And 95% of games are either ordering, grouping, or both. So this is like most of the tests right here, at least when it comes to games. Okay, so tonight when we do a game section, as you're going through, try to think, oh wait, are they asking me to order things? That would be going left to right. Are they asking me to group things? Up and down? Or both? Now, it may be something else entirely, but that's pretty rare. Okay, um, and I don't remember for this section tonight, I don't remember if we have a random game, but I, I doubt we do. Now, um, as I was saying, the rules are going to be dictated, or how you draw the rules are going to be dictated by the structure, and you'll either put them in or near the diagram. Um, once you're done writing down the structure and the rules, I want you to look for any floaters. So floaters are variables, basically, that were never discussed by the rules. Right? So let's say they, they tell you there are five people in a race, and they tell you that L is third, and they tell you that G and K come in that order, and they tell you M can't be first or something like that, but they never talk about O. Well, O is then a floater. And one thing you can do with floaters is you can just circle them. You can say, okay, O is a floater, and I'll just circle it. I should have chosen a different letter because it's a little weird, it looks like a donut, but um, let's say it was S, right? I would just circle that and say, okay, that's a floater. And notice I'm writing my floaters near my diagram so that I can see, okay, these are the variables that I have left. Nothing was said about them. They can go anywhere. I mean, wherever, whatever is available. Um, but you just don't want to forget about them. Okay, then the last thing, this is the most challenging thing for most people, is try to decide whether or not to do worlds. Now this isn't going to make sense until we do some of these games and you, you start to figure out what I mean by worlds, but just a, a quick sense here. Let's say you had an ordering game, one, two, three, four, five, and they told you that L had to be second or third. Okay? You could write that rule, and this is how I'd write it, by the way. I'd say, okay, well, here, L is either here or here, so I put a little arc to show that L is going back and forth. You could just leave it like that. That's the rule, L is second or third. Or you could say to yourself, wait a sec, um, I could create worlds. One world where L is second, and one world where L is third. Now, I don't know which one is correct, because both are possible under the original rule, but that's the point, actually, is that I'm creating the two possibilities, the two worlds, and then um, if knowing that L is second leads to other inferences, for example, if I now know that M has to be first because of that, um, then it could be beneficial because essentially by making those assumptions, by assuming that L is second or by assuming that L is third, you're able to take the other rules further than you would have if you still didn't know where L went, right? So, um, and this is, again, we'll, we'll talk about this more as we're doing examples, but this is probably the part of games that people struggle with the longest. They're like, well, I didn't know if I should do worlds or if I shouldn't. But here's the basic test. You are looking for variables that are constrained. Okay, variables that are kind of not fixed fixed, but somewhat fixed. 
right? So L was somewhat fixed, right? Because it could either go second or third. Uh, as we do these games, I'll, I'll talk about rules that are um, tend to be fixed or, or re almost fixed. But in any case, you look for variables that are, fix is not the best word, because now you're going to think, well, what about M? M is fixed and fit. No. Um, I'm not talking about like set in stone. I'm just saying like pretty constrained, right? Okay. So you look for variables that are pretty constrained. Maybe they can go in two slots, three slots, or four slots. And then you say, okay, what if I knew that L was second? Or what if I knew L was third? Would that be helpful, right? So which variables are are almost fixed, how many places, how many places can they go? Usually we're looking for like two to four places. Like if a variable can go in five places or six places or seven places, you may decide to do worlds, but you may not, right? That may be too much work. It's not worth all the effort. That's again a toss up. We're gonna have to talk about that as we go through these examples. But then, what you want to ask yourself is, okay, well, would that be helpful? Like, if I knew that L were second, would I be able to see any immediate inferences or things that have to happen because of that? And if you do, then you go ahead and do it. Okay, so that's worlds. Um, last thing, any questions about any of this? I know this is all kind of in the abstract, but this is just an overview. Okay, last thing is, uh, if you, especially if you decide not to do worlds, um, I would go ahead and do the if questions first. If questions are the ones that start with the word if, and they say something like, if n is fourth, which one of the following must be true, right? By saying if n is fourth, they're adding a new rule just for that question. And if you haven't done worlds, then a lot of times what you end up doing is you end up doing a world, so to speak, just for that question. Right? Like you put n in fourth and then you play it out and you see what happens. The reason I do these if questions first is that um, if questions are a little bit easier in some ways because they're giving you an additional constraint, right? Like the more constraints or rules that you're given, the fewer options there are. So you have less things like floating around. So you're like, okay, well now I didn't know where n was before, but now they're telling me if n is fourth. Okay, I'll go ahead and put n in fourth. And now that you know that n is in fourth, you might know more things, right? In any case, you create a world just for that if question, and then you can use that world to answer non-if questions. Like if a non-if question says, which one of the following could be true, and you saw it happen in a previous diagram, then you know that that could be true. Granted, that previous diagram where n was fourth was a little more constrained than the typical game, right? But if it worked there, then it's definitely going to work without that constraint, right? So non-if questions are sometimes called global questions because they have no constraints on them, like if questions do. But um, the point is, again, we'll see this. It's easier to understand in practice. But if you do the if questions first, you can use that work to answer non-if questions. So it saves you time. All right, that's games in 10 minutes. That's all you need to know. Um, uh, any questions about any of this? Okay, and then we just gotta do this over and over and over again. Okay. Oh, one other thing I should say here. Okay. Um, how do I describe this? Think of yourself as a computer. Okay, you are a computer. And what are games? Games are just a bunch of lame rules, right? And they're basically giving you those rules. And then they're asking you, hey, what must be true, or what could be true, or what could be false, or could be, or must be false, given the rules that we gave you. And um, what you essentially have to do, like if you didn't do any of this work, if you didn't do any of this work, what you would do is you'd go to the first question, and you would basically have to run right, a process and like run through each of those rules. You're like, okay, well, let me apply this rule, 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 blah, 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 right? And that takes time. And so if you have to do that for every question, it's like you're, you know, the fan and your computer would come on, right? It's like, okay, you have to run through all this. Okay, well, 
um, we do all this work to essentially like run out the possibilities beforehand so that we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time we do a question, right? Now, that said, and there still are going to be times where you need to process the rules, right? Even if you've done all this work. And also, to get to a point where you can create a diagram and make inferences, there are essentially two questions you can ask yourself, right? And that is, what variables are left? And this is question one. And question two, what do I know about those variables? Okay, so for example, let's say I had this diagram right here, right? And I have, I, I know that M is first and I know that L is second. Well, as a computer, you could stop here, and that's what a lot of people do. They go, oh, if L is second, I now know that M has to be first because there was a rule that said M is before L, right? <coughs> Sweet. You just made an inference. You're like a computer, right? You took a rule and you applied it. Congratulations. But um, if you stop there, then oftentimes you're selling yourself short, right? There might be more processes that you could run, but you're not letting yourself do that. You're just kind of throwing up, it's like a defunct program, right? You're like, okay, good, we're good. No, so what you want to do, let's say there's another rule that says K is before G, and let's say there's another rule, this is a very simple game, but let's say there's another rule that, oh, let's say our floater is S, okay? All right, so what you'd want to do is you'd want to ask yourself, who's left, right? And in this case, who's left? K, G, and S. And what do I know about them? Who's left? What variables are left? And what do I know about them? Well, what you know about them is what comes from the rules that affect the variables that are left. Okay? So here I would say, okay, well, I know that K and G are left, and I know that K has to come before G, right? And I know that S is left, and what do I know about S? I know that it's a float. Now, if you do that every time, if you figure out the variables that are left, and you figure out what you know about them, in other words, what rules apply to those variables, you can figure out whether you should stop trying to make inferences or processing things. Right? In this case, what I would do is I would look at these guys and I would say, okay, given these facts, can I determine where any of this stuff goes? Do you know where any of these things have to go? What do you know? It'd have to be KGS, right? No, not necessarily, actually. So S is a floater, so it can go anywhere. So it could be KGS, but S could also go there, right? And then you could have S, K, G. Um, are there any other options here? Yeah? Um, K cannot be the last one. Oh, okay, so that is something that must be true. What you're essentially doing is you're taking this and you're saying since K has to come before G, K cannot go here. What you've done is you've taken a positive rule and you've turned it into a negative rule. Um, that is a good thing to be able to do, but in general, just a side note here, we're gonna try to go in the opposite direction 90% of the time. So in most cases, what we're trying to do is take negative rules and turn them into positive rules. And since that's already happened here, um, I'm probably not going to make that inference. That is true and 100% correct. Um, part of the reason for that, though, is that if you write this right here, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to put K there, right? Like you would just see that and so you're good. But um, in any case, here uh, S could go in one more place, right? Yes? K and G. Yeah, it could go in the middle, right? And then you could have K come here and G come there. K just has to come sometime before G. That's what that dash is representing. So at this point, I'm like, okay, there are three options. Um, none of these things are set in stone, so I know I'm done making inferences. It happens very fast, especially the more and more you do this. But the point is, is that you're listing out who's left, who's left, and what do I know about them? You're incorporating the rules into your list, right? So here I'm noting that S is a floater and I'm noting that K comes before G. This is huge. People do this all the time. They start listing out variables and then they remember, oh, I know something. That, like, people might actually start out with something like this. They might say, okay, 
Well, M goes first, L goes second. Who's left? Oh, I know K's left. Um, I know S is left, and I know G is left. And as they're writing those variables, right, they're answering this question, what variables are left, they're like, wait a sec, I know something about K. K has to come before G. And so then, now they have that, right? And so just asking yourself this question makes you aware of things that you would just have out of sight, out of mind, right? And you're like, oh, I guess I'm done making inferences. No, you could make more inferences, and this is the key. So of all these things up here, <laughs> this might be the one that is most fundamental in some ways, because it's just a way to continue unlocking the game. It's like you're a Bitcoin miner, right? <laughs> you're like, you've taken this analogy too far. But that's how you mine for more information, okay? Sound good? Cool. Questions? All right. Um, last thing, when you do a section, and we're going to do a section tonight, don't stress about finishing. Your goal at the beginning of the section is to do game one. Once you're done with game one, your goal is to do game two. When you're done with that, your goal is to do game three. And if time ends, time ends. Okay? End of story. Um, finishing but then getting a bunch of them wrong because you went so fast is not a great short-term or long-term strategy. Right? If you can start getting everything correct, and really games is a section where you can get everything correct in the first two games, then I know you're on your way to getting like three games. And then eventually once you're getting three games 100% correct, then you know you're on your way to going to four games. So um, let's go ahead and get the, the demon up and we'll go from there.